Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. How you doing today, buddy? I'm doing great. So I noticed you took your son to Florida. Yeah, we went to Florida. Yeah. I don't know why I said it like that. It just I sounded don't fun. I don't either, but Florida. it was, that was fun. Yeah, and uh, how was it? Oh, hot and humid. Holy cow. I'm glad to be home for and, that reason. But we had a great time. And this is something you do when your kids graduate. You take them on a trip wherever they want to go. Yeah. Well, I mean, within reason. Yeah. We, I, I limited it to the United States. And I said, let's go do something fun together. Mm-hmm. And he chose, uh, he's a big fan of Arsenal, the English soccer team. And they were in town playing Chelsea. And so we went and saw them play, and Arsenal won four to nothing. There you go. He was super excited, and we did other fun stuff too while we were there. But we were just there for a few days. Do for your the kids, weekend. Do your kids ever say, "Dad, I just want you to be dead. Don't be a psychologist. Don't be trying to get in my head. Let's just relax and have some fun." <laughs> Actually, I don't hear that very often because, to be honest, I think that's easy for me to just be in dad mode when I'm with the kids. I don't, I don't think I do the psychologist stuff too much. You know, and, and when I see your Instagram posts and your Facebook posts, uh, you are the gold standard when it comes to wow, dads. Oh, that's I mean, nice I, I, like, And me and Josh have talked about this when you're not here. Uh, I mean, like, because you're talking I, about me, huh? I know you're a single dad, and when you have these birthdays, you have balloons, and you have cakes, and you have ribbons, and you have all this, this, all this cool stuff. And I'm like, I wonder who's doing that. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody, That's somebody's got to do it. <laughs> and and you dig it, though. I love it. It's way fun. Yeah. I, I have to admit, I, my kids are fun to hang out with. As they've gotten older, too, they've stayed fun to hang out with. And we always have a good time. Rarely rarely does it go south. So they're, they're easy kids to, to be a dad, too. I will say that. Now, take this with a grain of salt because I am divorced. But okay. I was talking to a married couple, and mm-hmm. they've been married for 45 years. And I said, what's the secret yeah. to your marriage? And he goes, always date your spouse. I like it. You know what I mean? And I want to change that too with our kids too. Always, you you know, you don't play with them. Yes. Have fun with your kids. Yes. I I, I know it's not our job to be their best friend, but it is our job um, to to be the best. Yeah. That's a treat. I actually had this conversation earlier this week with some some parents in in my office and it's, it's a blurred line. You have to be a parent. Mm -hmm. And so that means setting an example, parenting, doing all that stuff, setting boundaries, drawing boundaries. Yep. You got to hold your kids to certain standards, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean you can't play together. And I think you always should play with your kids. You were mentioning your son got a Lego set recently. Yeah. You know, those kinds of things. So at this age, it's Lego sets. And when he's older, it might be going on trips, places or doing things like that. But, you know, playing with your kids builds that relationship. And I agree with the sentiment, always date your spouse. What that really means is, I think what it means is that you're always um, developing the relationship with you're with an important person in you're your You're not life. just taking it for granted. Right, exactly. You know, Otherwise, it, it, it gets stale. Yeah. And so, so and then you get divorced. And I, I think we know about that. Yeah, <laughs> both of us do. And, and I know a little bit about your practice. And I know that when you sit down and you're you know talking to these young people, uh, a way to break the ice or to get them comfortable is playing a game. We play games sometimes, yeah. And I say this because I do this with my son every once in a while. He'll be like, hey, Dad, do you want to play some Mario Kart? Oh, now, I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. Not every time do I want to play Mario Kart. Mm, yeah, sure. <laughs> but with the look and the uh, love he says it, I'm right. like, yes. And before I know it, we're both sitting down playing a game of Mario Kart. And it's not even really about the game. It's about us talking, smack, having fun, right. and, and making that authentic connection. Uh, yeah. And I think sometimes you have to interpret the meaning of what your kids say. I think when your son says, hey, Dad, do you want to play Mario Kart? What he's saying is, Dad, would you spend some time with me? He's also saying, watch me kick your butt for yeah, the next two he, hours. He's chosen something that he's going to win at for sure. <laughs> he's like, hey, Dad, watch this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You haven't won yet, Dad. Nope, I haven't. I'm always Donkey Kong. <laughs> yeah, Donkey Kong's good. He's my favorite. Hey, so I had two cool things happen to me this week. Yeah. When I was out and about mm-hmm. uh, doing my other job. You're uh, always out and about. You, you're you around. Casey's always out there doing stuff. And so I, I'm always trying to keep busy, and that's part of my recovery. Uh, mm-hmm. I also take time for self-care, but I have a lot of uh, responsibilities. And so one of those is helping my mother. And so my mother called me, and she wanted me to pick up some stuff or uh, some property she owns. And I was like, cool, I'll do it, no problem. And I go pick it up. Mm-hmm. And I walk in, and I go, hey, I'm here to pick up uh, these stairs for my mother, and they go, who's your mother? And I go, Robin Scott, and she goes, are you Casey? 
And I mean, <laughs> yeah. And then, now, now, mind you, I just came from the gym. I look like a hot mess. And I said, yeah. And she goes, oh, it's so great. I, I listened to your podcast. It, it's absolutely oh, wonderful. Nice. Uh, I love Dr. Matt. And I was like, I love Dr. Matt, too. Oh, that's and nice. so we go through the rigmarole and, and we get the stairs. And then I'm walking out. And all of a sudden, the door opens. And I'm like, whoa. And she comes up. She goes, hey, I had to follow you out. Uh, I wanted to tell you, I got sober because of you. Really? And I said, excuse Aww. me, what? And she goes, yeah, I heard your daughter's letter, and I was in a bad position in my life. And uh, because of your letter and what you've done, I got sober because of That's you. That's great. Oh, and the reason I'm telling you this that. out front is because people don't know, and, and I don't share it with a lot of people. But what you are doing is making a difference. So in case nobody's told you today. Thank you for what ah, you're doing. That's fantastic. So I wanted to tell you that, Dr. Thank, Matt. I'm, thank you for sharing that with me, yeah. but also with the listeners. But I, I need to know those things, too, and, and that because you and I love it, mm -hmm. but we don't always know how it affects everybody, and I'm so glad she shared that with you. And so I kind of just sat in the car, and I, and I, and I got a little teary-eyed. I was like, wow. Crazy to think that four years ago, I was in such a bad situation, not knowing how life would turn out. And here we've been doing this now, and we're making a difference, and we're helping people. And so it was just a reaffirmation that what we're doing is working, and there's a need for it. And thank you for allowing us to do this. Yeah. I oh, Thank you to all the listeners. And to this, to this listener, uh, congratulations on mm -hmm. getting sober. That uh, I'm glad we, our show and Casey could be the inspiration for that. But- that's hard work. And you, so and, and they, and I, they did they did some hard work, and I hope they'll keep it up. And I said, you didn't get sober because of me. You got sober because of you. I'm glad that we were the inspiration, and we showed you that recovery is possible, mm -hmm. but you did the work. And I think that that's a, our guests that come on the show. Uh, their stories inspire people every week. And so uh, I think it's kind of this combination of we need some inspiration and motivation in our lives, and, and then we also need to take – ownership of the hard work we do to make change. Change is the hardest thing people ever do. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, and, and as cliche as it sounds, uh, everybody says, hey, if I can just save one person, it was worth it. Yep. Definitely. And I know this podcast has helped save many. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. I'm excited to hear that. Uh, second thing is I was DJing last night. Of course. Spinning on the ones and the twos. One is one record and two is the other one. So you go back and forth between them. That's the ones and the twos? The ones and the twos. Yeah. Or is there ever a third? Um, uh, no. Okay. No, because I don't know anything about the DJ. It's just the ones and twos. I've seen you do it. Yeah. You go back and forth. Yeah. And so last night I was DJing for, uh, this group. It's called the Utah Youth Court. The Youth Court. Yeah. And, yep. and, and I didn't know anything about the Youth Court. Oh, that's a cool program. And, uh, this lady named Lori, who's a listener of the podcast, reached out to me and they do this, uh, like three day event up at Weber State University where they get some of the graduates from the program along with some of the judges and the judges just happen to be students as well. Right. So it's kind of like this, um, this court system that's, uh, for minor, uh, infractions of the law, mm -hmm. instead of putting them in the court system, uh, you go in front of a judge of peers right. and they help you uh, make amends and they help you deter from making bad decisions again and letting you know that you're not defined by your uh, mistakes and you can move on from there. It, it seems like this really cool thing and maybe we should get somebody on here to talk about it. Oh, that's a great idea. I'd love, so I, working with a lot of teenagers over the last 20 years, I've had a lot of experience uh, with people I work with being in uh, the peer court, and I think it's a great program. I kind of think of it as sort of like a legal group therapy. Yeah. Like group therapy for legal reasons, because what happens is teenagers are much more likely to be uh, positively impacted by peers than adults. Sure. You know, and it doesn't mean adults don't play amazing roles in kids' lives, but when your peer tells you, hey, man, don't do that. You're goof. You're messing up. Or, you know, they're much more likely to hear that than if an adult says it. And you think about it on this podcast. By the time your kids get 15, 16 and 17, the biggest influence on their lives are their peers. It's no longer you for the most part. Right. There's you know, a natural like rebellion or pulling away from parents. And it usually starts in early adolescence, 12 or 13. Yeah. And then they kind of loop around when they're 18, 19, 20. Mm -hmm. But in that adolescent time, yeah, the peers have the biggest influence for sure. So they do this convention, and they asked me if I would DJ, and so I was like, sure. So I came and set up, and just like any kind of high school dance, the beginning 20 minutes is comical. Yeah. You know, because it's Everybody just, around the edges? Everybody's around the edges, <laughs> yeah. you know, girls on one side, guys on the other. Yep. Except for last night, girls on one side, guys on the other. 
Yeah. But right in the middle was this young boy. Yeah. And I put the first song on, and he just started stepping left, stepping right, and clapping. Just all by himself out there, just rocking and rolling. Stepping nice. left, stepping right. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. The guy wasn't a great dancer, but he wasn't a bad <laughs> dancer. But you know what he didn't? He didn't care. That's odd. That's he didn't what care. you have to. The confidence yeah. in this young man was absolutely amazing. So much in the fact that I stopped and I go, wow, this kid is owning who he is. I there. wish I would have been that brave and that confident right. at his age. I Not me. I and wouldn't have either. No. Here's the crazy thing. For the first two songs, he was all by himself and he never stopped. Yeah. But at the third song... Some of the girls came in, yeah. some of the guys came in, and it started to party. And then more came in, and more came on the other side. And by the end of the night, that whole dance floor was packed with people pumping their hair, hands in the air, having a great time. And the guy right in the middle was the guy who was stepping left, stepping <laughs> right, stepping left, stepping right, random clap. <laughs> stepping right, stepping left. And it, was, it. it was just so much. I was like, I mean, it made my heart so full just That's to watch awesome. this kid own who he is <laughs> and just be like, cool, I'm here to have a good time. I yeah. don't know what you guys are. You don't need fancy moves. No. Right. And, you know what I mean? And he never deteriorated from that move. And he kept it going all night long. Yeah. And he just owned it. And I was like, good for you. So much of the fact <laughs> that Baron and I was like, you know what? You impressed me tonight. That's he goes, awesome. what did I do? And I go, Nothing. You were just you. Yeah, you just did it. That's awesome. And it Good was for it, him. It was so cool, man. I was just yeah. like, and so teenagers are the best. They are, and the worst. But they're yes. the best. But they're the best. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, and I remember being that age. That that's a lot of courage that you're describing. Like I remember being. I didn't feel unpopular. I didn't feel unliked. But I I don't think there's a chance I would have been the first kid out on the dance floor. And he was the first one. Yeah. And the last one. Yeah. I like that kid. That's awesome. Uh, you got a challenge for people this week. I do. Well, I wanted to mention something, a little science update. Ooh. Got it right here. Science gets updated. Yeah, a little science update. So if people are wondering, is science helping people in recovery? The answer is yes. How? Uh, well, scientific research, my friend. Okay. Yeah, and this study, I'm actually not super familiar with the study, but apparently it's a multi- phase study and we're in phase three that just means it's been going on for a long time and they have different plans for each phase it's called the onward trial but onward obviously stands for something and i don't know what it is sure originated i believe in finland okay where a lot of good actually a lot of good research happens in uh substance abuse recovery no the Finns know their stuff they well they drink a lot and uh one of the things they've come up with is a new medication called endosterone mm -hmm. or ado4 Okay. And the new trials show that about 79% of heavy drinking reduces for people that take this for about six months. Isn't that cool? That's pretty cool. And it works on the serotonin receptors, just like things like Prozac does. And what it does is helps curb people's uh, desire to drink. And so it's actually a medication that is good for people that are worried about their heavy drinking and they want to just reduce it. So maybe learn to drink like a gentleman or people that are motivated to become sober and not drink anymore at all. So it's showing promise. I just thought I'd, I just saw that. It came across my little uh, university email uh, as a as something I might be interested in reading, and I thought I'd pass it along. So well, that, that's all. That's all. It's just an update. That, but seventy nine percent is tremendous. I mean, that's huge. When you talk about reducing people's heavy drinking, yeah, uh, the best way I can explain it, and it was in an alcohol class that I, I was forced to take, but I did learn some stuff in it. And mm -hmm. um, this wasn't rehab. This was another incident. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so they go. Here's how it it is. Is yeah. is a um, a cucumber starts out as a cucumber. Mm -hmm. and eventually it turns into a pickle if you ferment it long enough, right? You pickle it, yeah. You can never now take that pickle and turn it into a cucumber. Nope. So when it comes to drinking, once you go past that line to where it's an addiction, it's hard to go back, almost impossible. Right. And you pickled yourself. You pickled yourself. You're in a pickle. Yeah. So there's that line where if you can get your drinking under control and you can figure it out. Yeah. Now abstinence is the best for me, and and, sure. and 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 that's the way I've chosen my recovery, and that's what works for me. And uh, and we know that uh, you know alcoholism and substance abuse disorders tend to run in families. So mm -hmm. there's often a heritable or biological component. Genetic. Yeah, genetics. And so you want to look at that and say, if it's in my family, I might be one of those people that's better off just never drinking. Uh, but some people learn to drink for various reasons, trauma, anxiety, depression, those sorts of things. And uh, you're right. If you can kind of catch it and learn to 
become a, a moderate social drinker, that might be a, a good mindful. option for you. Being mindful about it, yeah. Which sounds silly because no, it does. <laughs> and I think you know, I I like at least discussing that because uh, instead of being sort of black and white, you either drink or you don't drink. The implication is then drinking is always a problem, but it's not necessarily for everybody. Yeah, you know, you know? I, I I still have friends, and I know many people who drinking isn't a problem, right? Um, and one of the wonderful blessings of my recovery that has been given to me is the conversation about addiction and alcohol and which now my kids are a part of. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to have that question. It was like, well, does alcoholism run in the family? Yep. We all, they know it. We got a podcast about it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? You want to know more about dad or grandpa? Go back and archive yeah. some of the old project recoveries. I think that's actually great because – whether it's health related issues, substance related issues, mental health, a lot of families just don't talk about the things that run in their family and that's really not fair to your kids. And speaking of family, we've often said that addiction is a family disease. It is. Uh, our guest today is Yvonne Rogers and she's not an addict, but she's going to talk about how addiction has affected her life. You're listening to Project Recovery right here on KSL. Hey, welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist. And we've just said that addiction is a family disease. It definitely is. Uh, It affects the family. uh, Not like. uh, Well, I would say this. If you disagree or if you think otherwise, you're 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 way behind the times because the reality is it is a family disease. It's very dynamic yeah, one person may be the one with the substance abuse issue, but both in how it starts and maintains and how we recover, it's all about the family. I used to say when I was active in my addiction, what do you care to my ex-wife, to my kids, to my mother, to whoever would give me grief? I'd right. be like, what do you care? I'm doing this to me. I'm not putting it down you. I'm not selling to you. I'm not trying to I'm do not any- hurting anybody. Yeah. It, you know, and it's just me. Yeah. And then getting sober and hearing my daughter's letter and seeing the look in my Frankie's eye and my son walking into Maverick going, my dad's not an alcoholic anymore. No, he said. Dad's, my dad's not a drunk. I know. I love it. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? And so it was affecting all my kids. It was affecting oh, my family. It was affecting clearly, my job. Right? And so it was. That's affect- denial. When a person says it doesn't affect other people it's just about me that sigmund freud nailed it that's denial right there denial and so that's why we wanted to have yvonne rogers in how are you good thanks for having me you're a bubbly cheerful uh (laughs) young lady thank you um you wanted to come in and talk about addiction uh not because you're an addict but because of uh, some things that have gone on in your life right how it's affected me from the other side and so you grew up here in the state of Utah. Correct. Uh, you grew up in the predominant religion, which is uh, LD. mo- LDS. Yes. And uh, so you didn't ever really drink. I did not. And I had never been around people that had drank before. And so I didn't realize when somebody was an addict or addiction. And my son, I mean, nobody in my family, generational, had ever been an addict or drank. And so... I was very naive to addiction, and I went through a divorce with my husband, who I had my children with, and Mm -hmm. my son suffered from addiction. I grew up the oldest of six. My parents were still alive, and then I have three children and three grandchildren, and my youngest son really suffered from getting me and his father getting divorced. So he took it really hard. He took it very hard. How now, old was he when you separated? Um, he was in third grade. Okay. So he he really rebelled, and I just I didn't see the signs. And I would have decorative bottles of alcohol because I didn't drink them, but I didn't know till after that he would sneak the alcohol and replace it with water. And so, that was- uh, uh, hold on. So, <laughs> so you grow up LDS, a Mormon, and and so as people know, you know, one of the tenets of the church is n- not drinking alcohol. Correct. Right? But but for decoration, I, th- I find that interesting. How did you, you – and these were – you'd buy a, a like a pretty bottle – full of alcohol and put it up as a decoration? Yeah, Is that what you're saying? I kind of turned away from the church after my divorce. Okay. So I was. So this was after the divorce that you started the putting the bottles yes. up. But they weren't just the bottle, it was full of alcohol. Yes. And okay. were you drinking at the time? A little. Okay. Once in a while, but not 
but the person I was with. Experimenting with a little. Yes. I really am not a drinker. I do not like but the I can taste kinda, of alcohol. <laughs> I can kind of see putting up the bottles as okay, yeah, an yeah. independence. Uh, I get to be me who I want to be. and Sure. You know, the, well, and you know, I, I actually think... Um, uh, I know plenty of people that collect bottles of various types. They are they can oh, be very beautiful, beautiful and, yes. <laughs> and decorative. Um, I also think Casey has some experience of doing what your son uh, did, <laughs> which is uh, trying to to replace the alcohol with water. Yeah, my dad one time sat down a bottle of frozen vodka, and he goes, "You know how I've been taking you've been taking my alcohol." I go, "How?" He goes, "Vodka doesn't freeze." <laughs> and that and bottle was yeah, frozen. I didn't was know frozen. that for a long time. The alcohol didn't freeze, yeah. and I'm like, hmm. so what age did your son start drinking? Uh, probably in ninth, tenth grade, and he started having problems in school, rebelling, and then he got in trouble in junior or high school and ended up getting kicked out. And he went to an alternative high school, but it was like, by damn, you're going to graduate from high school. And so he graduated with a GED from alternative high school, and then he started experimenting with marijuana, and then he got into heavier drugs. And he had a really good job. He was a manager, you know what a fast food restaurant, had a car that he got a loan for, had good credit, and then he really got into meth, and his world crashed around him. Lost. And what did that look like from your perspective? Uh, I mean, you know. He lost his job, and then he lost his car, and he was out of control, very disrespectful. Um, some days he he wouldn't bath um I what kind of help did you offer i offered rehab and he told me he didn't have a problem and it got to the point where as a mother i didn't know how to help him because i couldn't understand what he was going through and it got to the point where for me it was i'm gonna get a call that he's dead and it was to the point where that was almost going to be better than what I saw my son going through. And I didn't know how to help him. And I kept blaming myself because me and his dad got divorced. And so I thought, this is my fault that my son's going through this. And so I would enable him and I would give him money. And I didn't know he was going to use it for drugs. And I would help him. I'd pay his bills. And Did finally, you really not know he was going to use the money for drugs? I didn't. I... I felt so guilty. The guilt, the guilt got the best of me. And then he never stole from me, though. He never once stole from me. And he didn't lie to me, as far as I know. And it was just the guilt, the guilt. I'm like, I did this to my son. If I had not got divorced, maybe he wouldn't have done this. Let's, can I broaden our conversation just a little bit? You said you have three kids. Mm hmm. And he's the youngest, this right. son that struggled with, with drugs. Let's talk about the other two real real quickly. How old were they when you divorced, and what in what way do you think the, the divorce affected them? Um, my, my daughter was the oldest, and I found out she, she was a cutter, and she experimented with drugs. And then she ended up having some charges on her for vandalism, so I had to help her from going to, the judge was going to put her in prison for a misdemeanor, so I had to help her. My middle son, he was the caretaker, the caretaker of mom, the protector of mom, because mm -hmm. the divorce sent me kind of off the deep end. You know, I thought I was going to stay married forever. I'd been married for 20 years, and it just sent me off the deep end. And so your middle child, a boy, he was really attentive to your feelings. Yeah, he was like the picture-perfect child. <laughs> kind of be a pleaser. Yes. Did that change when he got older? No, he's still, still you know, the, the other two. Oh, you always, Cameron's the perfect child. <laughs> yeah, and oftentimes uh, when there's discord and problems in a family, one of the children uh, will, will become sort of the pleaser and the caretaker. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that it was the middle child in your situation. It's often the youngest uh, that that is that way, but um, uh, okay. So, it, it's, can we also maybe just briefly? Uh, I I'll say this: when I talk to couples about divorce, 
Uh, everyone, of course, uh, gets concerned about how it's going to affect their kids and what's right. going to happen when they get divorced. I know Casey and I've been there on a personal level wondering how is this going to affect our family. Right. Um, I think a long time ago, I mean, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, a lot, their divorce maybe was less common and less talked about. And so I think there was much more of a stigma around it. Nowadays, I think divorce is, is more common. There's still right. some stigma, I'm sure, but it, it's more prevalent. Most kids who are getting divorced have friends or family members that are divorced, so they don't feel completely alone. So one of the things I often say is, you know, divorce is a trauma for a family. It's a change. It is. Uh, but it, it's how we divorce that often makes the biggest difference versus the divorce itself right. when the divorce is really chaotic and stressful versus maybe more of a mutual agreement. Um, how would you characterize your divorce? There was a lot of fighting before the divorce. We would fight, 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 and that's one thing I wish we could change. Um, I don't want to say the reason we fought. Um, there was a lot of fighting, screaming, name-calling, bad words, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of bad language. And then we got divorced, and that was probably the best thing that we did because we got along a lot better after that. Okay. So it kind of calmed things down. Yes, and then very amicable after that. And there was no fighting. We didn't use the children as pawns, and we actually parented a lot better. The kids were able to go back and forth as they, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't, oh, you can only have the kids on this day. They got to go back and forth, and we supported each other in the parenting of the children. Okay, so both you and your ex-husband were present and, yes. and co-parenting, and and things calmed down, and the yes. kids were able to kind of Yes, I think it was forth. the trauma of the reason why we got divorced that affected him and the fighting of what we got divorced over Okay, that affected him. Now back to your son, uh, who was battling a meth addiction mm -hmm. and you said you were an enabler uh, a lot of it out of guilt yes and I think what she's describing is pretty commonplace for a lot of families who are battling with addiction sure um, and you not knowing where to go or where to turn to and thinking when you get that phone call late at night it's gonna be the phone call you dread yes and he he did actually I didn't know this, but he almost did die. Um, his girlfriend saved him from dying from drugs. I didn't know this till after the fact. And then he was at his dad's with his sister, and he had a psychotic episode when he was on meth. And so then he called me and asked me if I would then put him in a recovery program. And so I did. And he is now sober and clean to this day. And he has tattoo of an angel on one side and a demon on the other side to remind him of his addiction. And he said he fights it every single day. So that was kind of a, a one and done. He went into rehab and he's been sober since? He has. Wow, that's awesome. But he also, his girlfriend at the time um, got pregnant with his child. And I think that is what pushed him to stay sober for his son. I'm not sure he would have stayed the recovery program, I won't say the program, but they said he has an 80% failure rate when they checked him in. And so me and the, the program had the rounds because I said, you've already set him up for failure. Why are you Did telling? Did they tell him that? They told him that. Okay. As I'm checking. I don't know how I feel about that. Well, I'm telling you, that's the same thing that I was in rehab and the lady said 13. 13. She, was a, she was another person in the but program. But somebody's getting that information from somewhere. There was yeah. three of them his age. And they told the three yeah. of them and the other two, one died in, because it was an inpatient program for 30 days. They died in the program? One of them did. Wow. And one died two weeks after. Oh, my goodness. And then all of the other ones, they it, they were in there two and three times. <laughs> so, Well, and relapse, we've talked about, is often part of the process of a person becoming sober and in recovery. Um, but I, I'm always glad to hear when it's just one and done. I mean, that's the best, you know, if, we, right. if you can do it once. Uh, and, and like you said, maybe having a child was part of his motivation or, mm -hmm. or the shining part of his motivation. We all need some reason mm -hmm. to make big changes in life. And maybe that was his, but, um, I, I, I don't know how I feel about telling people, you know, 80% you're going to fail. 
Uh, I know that that may be sort of an in-your-face motivational technique. To, Scare tactic. To try to get a person to be like, no, I'm not, you know, an oppositional response. And maybe that was part of your son's personality as well. He's like, well, don't tell me I'm going to fail. I'll show you. And if, if that's the case, it worked. Right. So was this the only time addiction affected your family? No. And, and this affected, I mean, he ended up living with me and I had to ask him to leave because of his behavior. Then he lived with his dad. His dad kicked him out and then he lived with like mom and dad and he respected their boundaries. This was all while he was still using? Uh, yes, before he had his psychotic episode. Um, so then I thought, okay, I know about addiction. Uh, little did I know. <laughs> So then I married somebody that was addicted to beer. I'm thinking, beer, that's not alcohol. Oh, it is. <laughs> I went to rehab for it. Because, <laughs> yeah. like I said, I'd really not been around anybody that drank. And um, I never saw him without a beer in his hand. And he became very, very abusive over time. And it led to domestic violence, which ended up the breaking of my arm. And the abuse, I've since learned, goes hand in hand. Alcohol does not make an abuser. And alcohol brings out the abuse in a person. So, But I learned that they go hand in hand, that most abusers are addicts of some sort. And that it just brings out the person that they are. So before we get to... The tragedy. I mean, it, it, I'm so sorry. Thank you. When you married him, did you think he was an alcoholic when you first married him, or do you think it progressed throughout the years of your marriage? He was an alcoholic when I married him. And you, I just did not realize it. I mean, I had seen him pretty drunk, but he was a functioning alcoholic. Would, would it be fair to say that you just weren't – you weren't very educated on what an alcoholic is. And Absolutely. You, you didn't really, you'd seen him drunk, but didn't understand kind of to the full extent of his drinking. But also, I think hopefully one of the things this show and other similar shows do is educate people, uh, especially if you grow up with no exposure to drinking or alcohol or drug use, um, knowing like the signs and the symptoms and how to identify when drinking is a problem. So Absolutely. I think kind of what you're saying is you were somewhat naive. Very naive. I mean, for process. me, I mean, I would drink once in a while, like one shot, I would, it would knock me out. I mean, and so your experience was, <laughs> was like you weren't much of a drinker. And when you did drink, you just went to bed. Yeah. So, so you yeah. wouldn't have any of your own experience. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I'm not a beer drinker. I, I don't like the taste of alcohol. And so I ended up always being the DD and I can have fun without alcohol. He could not have fun unless drinking. If drinking wasn't involved, you couldn't have fun. You couldn't go to any place if it didn't serve alcohol. Everything revolved around alcohol. We couldn't plan a trip unless it had a bar. We couldn't go to a resort all inclusive how many bars are there and i started realizing how much alcohol was in his life when you know he what, gave directions it's well the bar's here the go to this bar <laughs> <laughs> like, you know the sad thing is you just described me <laughs> yeah you just described me and i'm like wow and so now that i've been away from it i'm like my goodness life revolved around alcohol alcohol and that's your experience and don't you think that's true for every addict for the most part, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The, that's the, you, from the time you get up in the morning, you're thinking about when you're going to have a drink and where you're going to have a drink. And, and you're mapping your day. Yeah. Just like, uh, you know, our guest last week, uh, Shay Sober. Uh, you know what I mean? She, yeah. She, she mapped her day. Her day around drinking. Uh, yeah. Drinking. And when? she said so much in the fact that it's the only thing that got her out of bed. Not to mention that she had two beautiful children. But it but, was the alcohol that got her up and going. You're listening to Project Recovery. We're going to hear more of Yvonne Rogers' story in just a few seconds. Welcome back to Project Recovery. Our guest today is Yvonne Rogers. Uh, she just kind of told us the story about her son who battled with a meth addiction, uh, ended up calling you one night after a psychotic breakdown and asking you for help. And yes. Let me let me make a comment there. Okay, just yeah. A lot of people, back to this idea of let's educate ourselves on substance abuse and alcohol, a, a lot of people don't realize 
that uh, substance abuse and alcohol abuse can create psychosis. And yes. that so we usually think of somebody like who's schizophrenic as being psychotic. And psychotic basically means that you're seeing and hearing things that aren't there. You're having hallucinations mm-hmm. and you're also having thoughts about things that aren't real, meaning delusions. Right. Right. And so uh, a person who always struggles with those things might have an organic psychotic disorder like schizophrenia. But a huge percentage of people who struggle with psychosis, uh, it's a result of their substance abuse. And so, you know, when you say I'm only hurting myself, that denial statement, remember, uh, you are really hurting yourself. And by putting potentially yourself into a psychotic state, you could endanger other people. Correct. When when people use the term manic, what does that mean? Uh, mania is a, a very accelerated uh, form of of thinking and feeling, and so uh, we that's often associated with bipolar disorder, where one extreme would be depression, mm-hmm. and the other extreme would be mania. A manic person uh, might physically manifest their mania through being very agitated, uh, not being able to sit still, not needing or wanting sleep. They might stay up for days at a time and their thought process is sort of on triple speed. And so it becomes very unproductive, unorganized. You know, they might come up with ideas and schemes. And so they often become delusional uh, as and even maybe psychotic as well. And what you described basically sounds like a meth bender. Yeah, meth very much puts a person into a manic state, and uh, those sorts of um, drugs are often dirty. You know, they're not a pure form of whatever they are, which isn't necessarily better, but a dirty drug, especially a street drug, you don't know everything that's in it, and so that can create all sorts of havoc in your brain, and a person can can easily become psychotic, Um, and the more often that happens, the more damage is done, and your pickle example, it really does put the person in a pickle because mm-hmm. uh, there can be damage that's done that is you can't come back from eventually. And I've uh, seen patients who are now clean and sober but will forever be struggling with uh, physical and mental problems because of the damage they did through through drug abuse. But your son is rocking his recovery and doing wonderful. He is absolutely wonderful. He has a great job well paying he is a great father he has a son 50 50 um we took the mother to court and he has 50 50 custody uh make sure his son doesn't do drugs and ask you know is educating him his son is almost eight now and he's been sober and clean for eight years and i'm glad to hear that he's sharing his experience and talking about you know drug and alcohol abuse to you some people might say well eight why would you talk to an eight-year-old about it well, guess what? I've had nine-year-olds in my office that are smoking weed with their older siblings. I yes. mean, it, it, you're, the kids aren't really ever too young to know that it runs in the family, that it's problematic, and that they ought to stay away from it. Yeah. You know, my favorite saying on this podcast is, talk to your kids about drugs. If you don't, somebody else will. Yeah, Absolutely. they sure will. You know, and yeah. uh, better to come <laughs> from you. And uh, yeah. then you end up marrying a guy who you said from the get-go was an alcoholic. Yes. But you didn't know. I did not. I mean, I should have with what I went through with my son, but I didn't. I mean, we had so much in common. Uh, When I was dating him, he would get drunk where he would pass out, and I would, you know, take care of him. And that should have been a red flag. But did you just think, well, because you didn't drink for the majority of your life, this is what people who drink do? Yes. And he's only drinking beer. Now, if it would have and the hard stuff I might have thought differently. I'm thinking, oh, this isn't an alcoholic. But, but Casey, you've said that too. You said, well, <laughs> I, I'm only in here for Bud Light, Mom. I shouldn't be in here. Yeah, it was two weeks into rehab. I called my mom. I go, hey, look, uh, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. People are in here doing meth, heroin, pain pills. I'm here for Bud Light. And she goes, nope, you're right where you need to be. But I can understand being naive, thinking that beer is something that you buy at the grocery store, at the market, at the gas station, at the rodeo. at yes. the And it, it says light. And you, it, get, yeah. you get the light. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and all the people who were uh, promoting it on TV and the advertisements are all. Looks fun. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but you, I mean, it's a drug. Yes, it is. And he had a, a great job. And he'd get up and go to his job. He never missed his job because of not 
Well, before the break, you said he was a functional alcoholic, and we've expressed our concerns about that statement, but that is very deceptive, right? When a person is doing, seemingly doing all the basics of life, you know, they're getting up, they're going to work on time, they're paying their bills, you know, that kind of stuff. It's easy to sort of overlook the depths of the problem. Yes, because he would get up, he would put um, Bailey's in his coffee to go to work. Which is an alcohol. Yeah, right. and I didn't realize how day. much because yeah. I'm not a coffee drinker, so I didn't know that. And who knows if he had alcohol at lunch. And then the minute he got home, he popped one. <laughs> yeah. And then on the weekends, he'd get up and have a red beer. That's beer and tomato juice. Yep. Oh, yep. yeah. That sounds horrible. It's a breakfast beer. Okay. <laughs> and then even when we would go camping, he would drive with a beer and Drinking and driving. So, Drinking and driving. How soon into the marriage did you realize that alcohol was a problem? Uh, not till after the first year. Things were great the first year. And then we had outside influences that come in and put stressors on him. And he started taking them out on me. I was the dog to kick when there was problems. And I thought, well, maybe when these go away, then things will get better. He just started taking them out on me. Now, verbally, physically? Verbally. The verbal started first. Well, the first incident, he grabbed the, my phone out of my hand and kind of broke my little finger. And I thought, oh, my gosh. So I, mo- I moved out. for. Can, can I ask about the word kind of? Yeah, because did, did he break it or not? He broke it. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> he broke it. Yeah. And so I moved out. Okay. I did. And then he talked me into moving back. And hindsight's twenty twenty. And then I moved back in. And then things started getting worse verbally. And then he would push me a little bit, push me a little bit, push me. And then he would start dumping beer on me. Dumping beer on you? Yep. He'd get angry and dump his beer on you? Yes. Wow. That's insulting. I mean, that's, that's really very insulting. Very insulting. And everything was always my fault. My fault. And it just got worse. And don't ask me why I stayed. I stayed. Well, I, but, do, I do know why I stayed because yeah. I loved him. And I wanted that person back that I fell in love with. And there's a video that shows women, they stay. And I didn't I didn't want another divorce behind me. Yeah, those are all common things. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. There is a lot. I mean, I agree with that. There are a lot of folks that are like, oh, you know, I don't want to be a twice divorced person. You know, if I, you know, if I work hard enough, you know, uh, the, 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 the person I fell in love with will come back. You know, mm-hmm. I just need to love them through it. I need, just need to support them. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of reasons why a person And might you had stay. the cycle of abuse, the highs. I'm mm-hmm. sorry. I'm sorry. I won't do this again. And then the lows. And then the highs started being less and less and the lows became longer. I don't know if this is going to be an ignorant question. And if it is, I don't mean it that way. Nope. But you said when dealing with your son. Uh, a lot of the reasons you enabled him was because of guilt. Yes. Because you thought it was your fault. Yes. Now, in the domestic violence situation, did you ever think, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying because I don't know, did you feel like th- this was your fault? Through my counseling, um, when I went through my first divorce, I tried killing myself because of the reason we got divorced. Um, So I didn't feel worthy. And so when I was with him and the names, he would call me and he would tell me I was fat and I was ugly and I had gotten anorexia from my first divorce. (laughs) This is hard, sorry. So I didn't feel worthy that anyone else would want me. And he would tell me that, that nobody would want me. I'd be worthless. Mm. And that's a lot of reason you know, it went over time. And so I really didn't think anybody else would want me. And I think a lot of victims stay for that reason. I mean, I had a, I had a job that I could have taken care of myself, but I was so embarrassed and I could see the good side of him, but it really wasn't that person. And so it continued and I stayed and I thought, oh, I can fix him if I'd be better, if I'd be better. And now I realize it wasn't my problem. It was his. And the drinking, you know, he got worse. He drank more and more and more. And the physical got worse. And he would blame me like I would have a bruise. And he'd say, you have dirt. And I said, no, it's from you hitting me. And he said, well, you must have done something 
to deserve it. (sighs) And so the night I showed up at his work on a Friday afternoon and he was mad at me because I showed up unannounced. (laughs) And so he was mad at me and that's what started the fight. And he carried it over to the next day and how dare you? You think you're better than I am? Why are you taking this away? And then he pushed me, broke my arm, had an obvious fracture to my arm. He went upstairs and said, "I'll get." Well, he said, "I'll give you something to cry about." He went upstairs, got a shotgun. I didn't know he had it till I come downstairs. And I heard the ratcheting of that shotgun, and he pointed it at me. And I don't know why he didn't pull the trigger. And he sat down next to me, put the gun underneath his chin and said, just one pull of the trigger and I can blow my head off. And I told him, go ahead. I don't care. Don't know why he didn't. Probably because he's a coward. Got up and I don't know how I had my phone. I called my son. He didn't answer. Then I called my dad. My dad came. I called 911. And I thought they would come in, but they didn't because of the gun. So the SWAT team was outside. My dad took me out, and as I was leaving, he said, way to go, Yvonne. And those were the last words he spoke to me. And he had had at least 30 beers to drink when he did this to me. Wow. So. And was he taken away, or did he end his life there? He was taken away. It okay. took him a while to get him out of the house. It was a SWAT standoff? Yes. Because he did not want to come out. And so they finally, after about 15 or 20 minutes, it says in the police report that he finally came out. And Mm. then he admitted to pushing me. And so, yes. Well, I want to thank you, first of all, for being so open and, and, and real about this experience. It's obviously still difficult to talk about and everything that led up to it. Um, the reason I'm thanking you for doing that is because so many people suffer in silence mm-hmm. because of being embarrassed and because they feel no self-worth, right. uh, because they feel no one will, will love or accept them or understand them, or they fear being blamed for the problems in their marriage. And so, so many people, and unfortunately it's, it's mostly women, uh, feel that they have to stay or they're too afraid to leave. Right. And it's important for this not to be a shameful thing to talk about. It's important for people to see you as an empowered person who overcame all of those things that happened right. to you in that relationship. Because so what happened to you should have never happened to you. Should have never right. happened. You know, it shouldn't happen to nobody. No, it should not. But it's through connecting that people become empowered. It's through connecting with your story. I'm sure there's somebody or somebody's listening to this show that are going to feel like it's time I did something too. It's time I had some courage and believed in myself to make a change. Yes, they need to believe they're, they're worth being alive. They're worth not being treated that way. I mean, the journey that I have taken, um, we need to band together and get these laws changed. I've been victimized through the court system, and that's the laws I want to get changed. And alcohol has affected and changed my whole life because I am permanently disabled now from what he did to me. And the law didn't take it seriously. He should have been charged as a felony, and they didn't. Uh, Because the only way they can get charged as a felony on domestic violence is if they permanently disable you or use a gun. He did both. And they charged him at a misdemeanor level, and he got 30 days in jail with work release. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's such a tragedy. So what are you doing now? I, I think well, let's talk about you you're wearing uh, a sling. Yes. Can you tell us about this disability that you have? Um I was able to work after even though my my wrist was disabled. Um so then I was still working. It was still difficult at the end of the day I couldn't use my wrist and that um I ended up developing CRPS which makes you feel like your arm is in what and tell people what that is it's chronic regional pain syndrome and they don't know what causes it and there's no cure for it so i was working and then two years later 
in June of 2020, a drunk driver rear-ended me. So again, somebody that has alcohol rear-ended me. I was at a stop and he was pulling a four-horse trailer and rear-ended me. And when you have CRPS, um, if you do anything to irritate, it can gravitate and move. And because of that incident, it gravitated from my wrist all the way up to my shoulder. And now my shoulder is frozen in place. And they were going to operate on my shoulder to unfreeze it, but the CRPS had moved up, and so I cannot have it operated on. And so my shoulder is frozen in place, and I can't use it. And then it irritated and made my wrist worse to the point where I couldn't hold. I can't write with it, and I can't use a mouse or anything. So then I had to quit working because of the situation. And you're right-hand dominant. And I'm right-hand dominant. So that really stole from you your ability to work and do most things. And so that was a very hard time that I went through. Um, I felt like I was useless. And I went through a period, a very dark period, but I was in counseling. I finally got into counseling at Safe Harbor, and it made me angry. What is Safe Harbor? Um, it's for victims of domestic violence. It's They have a safe house there, which... I believe if a woman is in imminent danger, they should be put in a shelter, but I have an issue with that. It's like if we have a gunman, a child that's going to shoot up a, a house, you know, threatening to shoot a school up or threatens, they take them out of the home and put them somewhere to get them help. They like taking the victims out of the home and putting them in a shelter. I think we should take the abuser and put them somewhere, not remove the victims. Mm. That's my mm-hmm. issue. You put them in a shelter, then what are we doing to solve the problem of domestic violence? That's maybe more of a temporary measure, but doesn't really get to the heart of the problem. It doesn't solve the problem of domestic violence. So that's one of the issues. It just gets you out of imminent danger. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in my situation, I feel like it's given the abuser more power because Mm -hmm. we're not punishing the abusers. And it continues the cycle of abuse. Yeah. So my goal is to change the laws and make them tougher. So how do you go about doing that? I'm trying to get the t- legislators to answer my emails. I've talked to a few and they think what I'm wanting done is great, but then I don't get any action behind it. Mm. Well, that's because politicians like to agree with everybody on both <laughs> sides of the aisle. And I think that action speaks louder than words. And if they're not getting back to you, then their words are meaningless. Right. Um, and in recovery, uh, we like to make our mess our messages. Yes. And so out of all the trials and tribulations that you've dealt with in over just past four years, which seems to be a lot. Yes. Uh, you're getting ready to start a podcast. I am. And you want to help with domestic violence. Absolutely. And where can people find that? Um, it's on the Resiliency Talk Network. I don't, I don't know anything about this. Uh, it is... On YouTube, um, Al Richards, The Other Side of Addiction. It's uh-huh. on that network also. Uh-huh. Um, I'm just starting filming my commercial. And it's going to be the High Hill Movements Against Domestic Violence because men were the first ones to wear high heels. So it's for men, women, and children because men are also victims of domestic violence also. Men were the first to wear high heels? They were. I did not know that. <laughs> Probably the judges. That's why it's back called in, the... When they wore wigs, too. Yeah. It was actually yeah. in um, uh, Persia. Okay. So they could ride their horses into battle. They could keep their feet in the saddle. Ah. Yes. Okay. Cowboys <laughs> were the first to wear high heels. That's and what I learned And then royalty today. would wear high heels. <laughs> so, yes. So I just want you to remember... When you hear somebody in active addiction say they're not hurting anybody but themselves, refer them to this podcast and see that addiction truly is a family disease. It is. And you're permanently disabled because Mm -hmm. of two people's uh, addictions to alcohol. Yes. And then I'm also writing a book. It's in the editing process now, and it's called And With a Broken Wing. And it's not about my story with him. It's just about the end and then my struggle through the judicial system and what's happened. So you've really been inspired by your life experience to yes. help other people through the legal system and trying to change the laws. It sounds like make them more appropriate and maybe yes. more 
severe for people that are um, uh, uh, guilty guilty, uh, guilty of a, yes. a domestic violence. Well, because one law in particular, um, when you have a protective order against you or you have um, a conviction of domestic violence, you cannot have guns. Mm-hmm. He had 17 guns. He, I turned them into the sheriff's department, and he took me to court for contempt of court to get his guns back. He was awarded his guns, and I was held in contempt of court. Really? And ordered to pay his attorney fees. Unbelievable. And I went to the prosecutor and said, help me. I need help here. And they told me that he had them before he could have them back. And so I went to the attorney general's office. They got me in contact with the U.S. attorney who in got me in contact with the ATF, and they stepped in and said, no, you cannot have your guns, and helped me. Well, I'm wow. glad somebody had a, <laughs> a sane brain on that one. That's ridiculous. And I'm finding that's actually quite common that they do have their guns, so that's something I'm working on. Okay, yeah, I, I – I would fully support that. And I'm pro-gun. It's just they shouldn't be in the hands of people that they don't belong in. I agree with that. Well, uh, please let us know how your, uh, your 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 mission goes. Thank you. Thank you for stopping by and sharing your story. Thank I assume you people so in the near future could find your book on Amazon? Yes. And and a podcast on, what was the Resilience Network? The Resilience Network. We're on YouTube. On YouTube. And Amazon. Uh, actually, on um, call Apple Cast, Podbean, um, anywhere you get your podcast, a- yeah, all the anywhere. podcast outlets, YouTube, yeah, all love of it. them. Well, thank mm-hmm. you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate you stopping by and listening to another episode of Project Recovery. I love you. I mean it. And in case you forgot, Project Recovery is what? It's a KSL podcast, Casey. Mm-hmm. of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk.